Well, thank you, Q, for that wonderful song. What a great message to think that God um, welcomes our struggles. He knows who we are. He knows that we struggle in certain areas, and he really welcomes that. But you know what? He doesn't want us to stay there. He wants us to be uh, delivered from that. He wants to cut the chain free so that we can live a life of, that's full and victorious and effective and uh, abundant. And so what a great reminder of that this morning. And as we gather this morning, I'm in the chapel downtown at the Standard uh, Building. And I want to invite you here this morning, you know, through the years, there's been a lot of people that have gathered here on Sunday morning or in midweek for a service or a Bible study. And I wonder how many times people have walked into this little chapel here and they've had struggles. And they've been honest about that before God. And they've heard messages of hope from God's word that shows them that they can be delivered from that. And I wonder how many times they've just surrendered that to Jesus and been set free. But then there's also people, I'm sure, that have walked in here and that have heard the gospel in a way that made them realize that they needed to trust Jesus in a personal and saving way. And they just surrendered their heart to him. They believed in his death and resurrection that was accomplished for them. And they were set free from that fear of death. And they were confident of their eternal home. And so what a great place to gather as we're reminded of God's wonderful love for us this morning and also his desire for us to walk uh, as his children in a way that's victorious. And so this morning I want to continue on in our study as we think about the teachings of Jesus. And today I want to talk about a passage in Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus talked about anger. Yes, I said that. It's anger. And some of you may be switching the channel or... <laughs> wanting to maybe listen to a different pastor this morning, but I want to encourage you to stay with us. Because what Jesus has to say is really relevant. In fact, as I have prepared for this message, I've been convicted about my own thoughts and attitudes, uh, maybe some bitterness has welled up in me that I've had to let go this week. And so I just want to encourage you to stay with us as Jesus uh, gives us this teaching on how we can be free from a sinful and destructive kind of anger. And so notice the passage that we're going to look at this morning in Matthew chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, you can... You can read along with me this morning, Matthew 5, verse 21. Jesus says, You have heard that the ancients were told, You shall not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, You good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, You fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Wow, that's a pretty powerful statement that Jesus makes here. But notice really he, he addresses two things. First, he addresses the act of murder. But then secondly, he addresses the attitude of murder. And so we're gonna see this morning that anger isn't sinful necessarily. It's an emotion that God gives us. It can actually be used in a righteous way. In fact, God, is righteously ang angry at times. But it's never vengeful. It's always in response to sin. It's a holy kind of love, a holy kind of anger that causes God to be frustrated and angry over sin. And sometimes we can be righteously anger over things that we see in our world or in our families because it violates God and his word. But you know what? There's a fine line between righteous anger and a sinful, destructive kind of anger. And that's what Jesus is going to warn us again against today, is that sinful kind of anger. So notice, first of all, he talks about the act of murder. He says, thou shalt not commit murder. Well, that was the sixth commandment in the law of Moses. The people of his day knew exactly what that meant. They knew what the consequences would be if they committed the act of murder. It would mean that they had to give up their own life. That was serious business. In fact, most of the people that were in his audience that day could kind of stand up a little taller and say, you know what, I've never committed murder. And I suspect today that most of us, all of us listening today can kind of proudly say, you know what, I've never committed murder. Isn't that great? I can check that box, I'm good to go. But Jesus isn't gonna let us off the hook. He didn't let them off the hook here. He said, that's the act of murder, but I want to raise the bar a little bit. I want to talk this morning about the very attitude behind murder. And so notice he says, I tell you that if you're angry with your brother, you're guilty. 
He goes on and talks about kind of what flows out of a sinful kind of anger, uh, signals that we can look for in order to um, beware of a sinful kind of anger and guard against that in our lives. But he says here, if you're angry with your brother, you're guilty. So the intent of the law here, we see Jesus kind of backs us up from the very act of murder to the root cause of murder, that attitude of murder. So he raises the bar here and he says, I want to make sure that you're living in a righteous way. Um, be angry against those things that I would be angry against, but don't be angry against those things that I would, I would show mercy and give forgiveness to her. And so Jesus is raising the bar in a sense. But, you know, I can hear some of us saying this morning, as we think about anger, which sometimes is called a respectable sin, a sin that we would tolerate because, you know, it just doesn't seem to be that bad. You know, what's, what's wrong with a little outburst of anger? You know, that's just kind of who I am. I just blow up, and then I get it over with, I get it out of my system, and then it's all done. And Jesus would say, no, we're not going to let you off the hook on that one. Some of us might say, well, you know, that's the way I was raised. My parents were like that. He's not going to let us off the hook. And so he's going to call us to make a big deal out of this kind of hurtful, sinful anger. Jesus would say to us that this anger isn't just an action that we do. This anger is an attitude. This anger is, comes from a thought that's hurtful. He would say that this anger, this hurtful and sinful, flows out of our heart. Over in Matthew chapter 15, notice what he says here. He says, for out of the heart comes evil thoughts and murders, there it is, and adulteries and fornications and thefts and false witnesses and slanders. So Jesus said all these things flow out of our heart. They're not just actions that are offensive to God and hurtful towards others. These things begin to take root in our hearts before they're ever acted out. And so Jesus is going to call us to really check our heart this morning. You know, what's going on inside? Is there things that we need to deal with on the inside of our heart and our minds this morning? Well, notice what he says here in Matthew chapter 5 again. In verse 22, he kind of gives us this progression towards this destructive anger and even murder. He starts out with anger. He says, you're angry with your brother. That's the seeds of murder that can be planted in our hearts and our minds. He said, you're angry with your brother and you're guilty before the courts. But then he doesn't leave it there. He shows that the next step can actually be abusive language toward others. He says, some of you are saying to others, you're good for nothing. That word in the King James is raka. You're a good for nothing. You're empty headed person. We would say in our day and age, that, that person is brainless. We begin to call names. We begin to judge their uh, mental aptitude but then that but then it leads to even worse not only are we angry and we have abusive language but it could also lead to a cursing kind of language and notice what he says here you next say you fool you fool that that's kind of a judgment of the moral aptitude of a person in other words we would say you know what I, think you, I don't think you deserve to be here. I don't think you deserve to be around. That would be the progression that we'll lead to. We're angry, we abuse them with our language, but then we curse them. You fool, I wish you weren't even here. I don't think you deserve to even be a part of this. And so we can see the progression and then if we act upon those impulses, it can actually lead to murder. And so Jesus is saying here, we need to look at our heart. You know, what's going on in our heart when somebody hurts us? I mean, how do you respond when somebody cuts you off in traffic? What's your first response? What's the default in your life? Uh, what about if you stand in a line, a long line, and all of a sudden somebody comes up and they cut two people in front of you? How are you going to respond to that? That seems so wrong. How are you going to respond? Uh, parents, how do you respond to your kids when you tell them to do something and they talk back or they fight back or they run the other way? How do you respond to that? Do you yell? Do you get angry? How do you respond? 
I think we all have to ask ourselves those questions, and it will help us understand where we're at in this area of anger. And so Jesus said we need to look at our heart, need to examine our motives and our thoughts and our attitudes. You know, there's an invisible world going inside each one of us. And it leaves us with a choice when we've been offended or hurt. We have a choice. Either we can practice this revenge scenario, I call it. In other words, when I see that person again, I'm going to let them have it. Or here's what I'm going to say to them. I'm going to make this argument against them. I'm going to prove to them that I'm right. That's a revenge scenario. But I think the other choice that God would want us to make is a redemptive scenario. You know, how can I show mercy? How can I be patient? You know, Jesus said we should, even, we should love our enemies. We should pray for those who have despitefully used us. How can we forgive those who have hurt us and offended us? How can we do that? How can we be kind and patient? Well, God has to help us. So we need to practice that redemptive scenario. And I oftentimes have to give myself a pep talk. I have to talk myself into how I'm going to respond because naturally I just want to lash out. But God would want me to show grace and mercy just like he showed to me. And so we need to give ourselves a little pep talk now and then and maybe that's this morning for you. So there's this attitude of anger. And it, it flows out of me wanting my way. You know, it's a pride. It's a selfishness. I want my way. And that person's standing in my way. And so we have to give ourselves this pep talk. And I have to do that on a regular basis. So this morning, I want to see that, I want you to see that anger is not a sin. Anger is actually a signal. Uh, so if we were out today uh, driving down the road and and uh, we were going along with traffic, and all of a sudden there was a stop and go light ahead. And it's green, so we can just continue to proceed uh, as normal, but as we get closer, the light turns yellow. Uh-oh, now we have a choice, don't we? That yellow light means caution. In other words, we have a choice to make. Either we can proceed ahead, we can give it gas, and sometimes I do that and the light turns orange because it's almost red, and I put myself in the possible place of danger then. I just gun it ahead. But then the second choice that we can make is we can put on the brakes and we can slow down and we can prepare to stop. And really, that's what anger is. It's a signal. It calls us to slow down, to proceed with caution. Sometimes we need to stop because if we give it gas and we just let our emotions drive the car, sometimes we end up in an intersection it's really dangerous. And sometimes we collide with other people in such a way that it's very, very destructive. It's been said that anger is one letter away from danger. And so we need to see anger as a signal. It calls us to slow down, to evaluate the situation, see what we can do to have a redemptive outcome. You know, in the Old Testament, there's a story where I think we see this illustrated. It's the story of Cain and Abel. And you're probably familiar with this story. Uh, Cain and Abel were Adam and Eve's uh, first sons. They were the first kids. And you remember, um, Abel was a keeper of the crop. Uh, Abel was a keeper of the animals, and Cain was a keeper of the crops. And so they each brought their offering to God, and God accepted Abel's offering, but He rejected Cain's offering. And we see in the book of Hebrews that it's because of the faith that they offered it in. And so we see then in Genesis 4, here was the outcome. Here's what this story led to. It says, Abel on his part also brought of the firstlings of his flock, of the fat portions, and the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering. But for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. In other words, God could see on his face that, hey, something was wrong here. Something's welling and brewing inside that isn't good. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and his desire is for you, but you must master it. 
Notice what God says here, Cain. I can tell by your face that something's not right. I can tell that you're brewing over something. I can tell that you're, the animosity between your brother and you is just beginning to grow. And maybe even with God, he was angry. It didn't seem fair. It didn't seem just. And God said, Cain, you have a choice. Your sin's crouching at the door. You need to master it. Or otherwise, it's going to master you. Well, we know how the story ended. Cain was so enraged against his brother that when they were alone in the field, he actually killed his brother Abel. And so we can see that God tells us here, uh, the caution lights on, you have a choice. What's it going to be? Is it going to be a redemptive outcome or is it going to be a destructive, revengeful kind of outcome? And he leaves the choice to us. So this morning, I want to look at four ways that we can master our anger. The first thing is we need to listen. We need to really listen to people. Because sometimes when we really listen, we find out things that we don't know. Maybe the situation changes when we find out all the details. Or we find something out about another person. Notice in James 1, James says, But everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For the anger of man does not accomplish the righteousness of of God. So if we want to be righteous before God, we want his plan to go forward, we need to be really good listeners. So are you a good listener? Do you really listen to other people or do you just kind of march ahead with the assumptions that you might have? I think if we're really good listeners and um, really try to understand the situation, we can accomplish God's righteous plan. The second thing that we see here is not only be good listeners, but we also must Ask God to reveal any hurtful way that might be inside of us. Notice what David says in Psalm 139. He said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there's any hurtful way inside me. So in other words, God, um, David here is asking God to reveal any hurtful ways inside of me, any destructive ways that might be acted upon to cause friction in a situation or in a relationship. We need to ask God to search us every morning. And as we spend time in his word and we allow the spirit to speak to us, God points out the areas in our lives that might be destructive if we don't deal with them. So we need to trust God to reveal those things. And then thirdly, we need to repent of any sinful anger in our lives. Notice in Colossians 3, Paul says this, But now you also put them all away, put away anger and wrath, and malice, and slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. He says, put those things away. Put them aside. Repent of them. Go down a healthy, destructive way. Let God cut the chain loose and live a life that's free and fruitful. And so we need to repent of any sinful anger that God points out. And then finally, we need to reconcile quickly. If there's a difference between us and another person, if there's some friction there, we need to reconcile. Notice what Paul says in Ephesians 4. He said, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Do not give the devil an opportunity. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. So we've got to reconcile with others quickly. We can't let the sun go down on our anger. If we do, we give the enemy a foothold into our situation and then it can naturally progress to this destructive kind of anger. And so he says we need to put all these sinful things away and we need to reconcile quickly before the sun goes down. So this morning, maybe God is speaking to your heart about in this area of anger. Maybe you wrestle with that and maybe you need him to deliver you from that this morning. I would just ask you this week to let him reveal to you what's really going on in your heart. And if there's some bitterness or resentment or anger or hurt, that you haven't let go of, that you haven't repented of? If there's, a, if there's a relationship that you need to reconcile, would you do that this week? Would you let the Spirit of God work in your heart uh, so that you can live a fruitful and productive life, so that you can make a big difference for God's kingdom? We need Jesus' help to do that. We really do. So let's ask him to do that this week. Father, we just thank you for your power. We thank you um, for the hope that Jesus gives us to live a victorious Christian life. Jesus told us he wants us to be salt and light in a hurting world. And so I just pray that you give us the strength to do that this week. If there's any hurtful ways in us, if there's any areas that need to change, God, that you would just shine a light on those, that you would allow us 
to uh, let your word and your spirit do a work in our hearts so that we can live free, that we can live productive, that we can live fruitful. And so God, guide us today, guide us this week, and may we be sensitive to where you're leading and responsive to what you're saying. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.